Okay, two minutes past the hour. Um, let's get started. Um, welcome to everybody. Uh, welcome to esteemed uh, committee members and also all um, members of the audience. Uh, this is ZJ's thesis defense. Um, as is the norm, what we'll do is uh, ZJ will give uh, a talk open to everybody. We'll have a question and answer session, and then there'll be um, more uh, intensive questioning uh, by the committee um, afterwards. Okay, so as is custom at the IFA to start, I will give a short introduction so you can uh, get to know ZJ and then he'll tell you about um, his science. So let me um, share my screen with you. Okay, and if I hit play, see the uh, slideshow. Good, okay, so people can see my slides. Good, okay, so welcome to uh, ZJ's uh, thesis defense. Uh, I'm Michael Liu, I'm his uh, thesis advisor. Um, to remind you, here's what, um, here's what ZJ looks like in his native habitat. I actually haven't seen ZJ in almost two years in person because of you know what, um, but we do remember uh, he uh, came to Hawaii uh, from Nanjing University and we were very lucky uh, to get him. Um, now, uh, most of you know that he goes by the name ZJ, but those of you who know him very well actually know he goes by another name and that is uh, Triple Z. So I'll be telling you about the story uh, behind uh, what Triple Z is like. And so briefly, who is Triple Z? Now, as I think many of you know, uh, Triple Z is a you know, fantastic scientist. He's the sort of student that uh, makes you look like you know what you're doing as a thesis advisor. Uh, since he's been here, uh, we've had some really fun time doing all sorts of uh, low mass science of which he'll tell you about some of this. He's not gonna talk about all of these papers uh, during his thesis defense, but he's been just a fabulous maker of science. His work has been recognized at the university level with this uh, UH Regents Prize for Excellence in Research, given to only a small number of PhD students across the entire university. So he's really been an outstanding maker of science. But Triple Z is also known as a maker of a number of other things that you may not know about, and I thought I would share you um, share some of those with you today. Um, he's also a maker of videos. Uh, if you go to YouTube, you can see um, DJ um, giving a video to talk about some of his work. Um, so he has a great interest in things uh, audio visual. Uh, on the audio side, he also has an interest in, uh, in, in music. So he's also a maker of hip hop. And um, if we were meeting in person, um, the original plan was for the post thesis uh, party to include a musical performance by ZJ. Unfortunately, that will not be possible due to COVID, but he will be back next month, so perhaps we can arrange a performance. I understand he does a very good Eminem uh, impression. Uh, also during his time in graduate school, he was the maker of a band. He was in a band for a couple of years and they had a, a very prosperous um, uh, gigs in Waikiki. The band was named Triple Z and the Zs. Um, I understand the band fell apart because there was some dissatisfaction among the band members at the naming of the band. Um, and he's also a maker of substances. Um, I'm not quite sure what is going on in this picture, uh, but I found it and I thought, I thought I'd share with you his exploits. I was wondering what he was doing. Um, so I, I, I Googled and this is the closest thing I could find to Google. Uh, I'm not quite sure exactly what is going on, but uh, maybe ZJ can tell us during the question and answer. So that's, that's ZJ, uh, Triple Z, uh, the maker. Um, but those of us who know him very well actually know that Triple Z is, is renowned for being um, not just a maker, but one other thing, and that is a lover. So let us talk about Triple Z, the lover. Uh, Triple Z is known as um, a lover of animals. Um, and again, they just seem to flock to him naturally. Uh, Triple Z is known as the lover of uh, desserts. Um, and here he is enjoying um, something very sweet and very filling, probably not very healthy. Um, but his greatest love of all, um, as those of us who know him, um, especially as Chinese people know that his greatest love of all, of course, is the love of pork. And I'm not quite sure where he's sourcing his pork from, but it looks like he's got a very good relationship with pork. And again, if, we, if, we ever, if there was a party, I, I would be sure that we would invite pork to the party too. Okay, so today's, um, today's uh, ceremony is we know he's a maker and we know he's a lover. The question is, will he be a person with a PhD? And um, if there are any RU students here or first time attendees, as you all know, um, these PhD defenses are often very happy times. They're celebratory, people moving on to the next phase. But also you know that sometimes 
In fact, about half the time, the outcome is, is the opposite. And so we will see today and in the question sessions whether we'll have a happy outcome or an unhappy outcome. Like I said, it's been running 50-50 for the RU students, so hopefully you'll be coming to one of the happy occasions. Uh, if in the end this is a happy occasion, um, DJ will be moving on um, to where apparently most people in my research group go, and that is the University of Texas at Austin, where he'll be postdocing with uh, two of the young stars in our field, Brendan Bowler and Carolyn Morley. And so he'll be trading in his, um, his Hawaii um, outfit uh, for something more appropriate uh, for Texas. And so let's see in the next hour or so um, if he actually is going to make it there. Okay, so take it away, uh, Triple Z. All right, thank you very much for a very nice introduction, Mike. Uh, so I will share my screen. Okay, so uh, you can all see uh, the slides, I assume. All right, so, okay. So hello everyone, uh, welcome to my defense. Uh, so today I would like to present my dissertation which is about the discovery and characterization of giant planets and brown dwarfs that are wide orbit companions to SARS. So over the past few decades, uh, we have discovered a lot of planets outside our solar systems. And here I use a diagram to show these objects mass and centimeter axis. Uh, so it demonstrates that we're really probing a very wide range in the properties of all of those extra solar planetary systems. And here for all of this, exoplanets. They have been found by a variety of approaches, including transits, uh, microlensing, radio velocity, direct imaging, and many others. Uh, they are very interesting in their own way. And in my today's talk, I would like to focus on the directly imaged exoplanets. So these image planets are appealing in the sense that they are self-luminous and thereby we can directly see the emitted light from their photosphere. So here I show three systems that host well-known uh, direct image planets. So first system is Beta Peak. So this is a member of Beta Pictoris Young Moon Group with a very young age, uh, like 24 million years. Uh, the star hosts two planets with several Jupiter masses. So the second system, HR8799, uh, hosts four giant exoplanets uh, with mass between seven to 10 Jupiter masses. Um, and also the age of this system span a range between something like 30 to 160 million years. And the third system is Phase one Airy. This is also a member of a Beta Peak Peak, a Beta Peak Young Moon Group. And the star hosts at least one giant exoplanet with a mass of two or five Jupiter mass, depending on what kind of formation scenario we're talking about. And finally, the orbital separation of all of these uh, image planets uh, span a range of two to 70 AU. So if we compare with our own solar system, then they are actually located at similar or much farther distance than our own Jupiter. So on the right, I show the observed emission spectroscopy for three image planets. So now given this great spectroscopy data, we can uh, like study the atmospheres in greater detail, including their clouds, thermal structure, and also composition, based on which we can further investigate uh, their formation and evolution. However, current spectral analysis of these image planets are facing several challenges. So the first challenge comes from the data. So the existing emission spectra of these image planets suffers from small samples. So there are in total one to two dozens of data. And also most of these spectra have a, 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 like relatively low spectral resolution and also low signal noise ratio, mostly because these planets are really faint. And in addition, there are some challenge uh, for the models that we need to interpret this data. So here I show a figure made by Mark Marty uh, demonstrating all kinds of possible or complex physical and chemical processes that could happen on our own Saturn, which is also true for many giant exoplanets. So in order to properly explain the properties of the giant planets, the models thereby have to, therefore have to uh, incorporate many of these processes uh, into account. So in reality, there are some limitation and complexity in the calculation and analysis, and therefore it's normal for the models to make some simplifications for these processes. So in the end, the model predictions do not necessarily fully reproduce the data. So that means if we want to use the models to uh, explain our data, we better to first carefully test the model predictions. So to overcome the challenge uh, for the data and models of the direct image planets, I would like to highlight the value of the planets and brown dwarfs that are wide orbit companions to solve. So here by wide orbit, uh, I mean, their orbital separations are beyond several hundred AU or angular separation about several arc seconds. 
So since that these objects are really widely separated from the host stars, we can obtain high quality spectroscopy without concerns about the contaminating light from the host stars, which is a case or which is an issue, uh, potential issue for the uh, analysis of image packets. And also the spectra of these white companions are also similar to the spectra of the image planets. So let's see some examples. So here I show the emission spectra of beta big B and we can see this spectra is really similar to the one shown in blue. Uh, and this object is 2 mass to O49C. So this object is a white companion to a binary host star and with this orbital separation around 2000 AU. And this system is also a member of beta peak moving group. And also for the HR A799D, we can see a similar spectra from our VHS 1256B. And this object is also a companion to a tight binary star uh, with the orbital separation above 100 AU. And finally, for the fit one area B, we can find a similar spectrum uh, from G to O4B, which is a T6 dwarf as a very wide orbit separation companion to a field star. Uh, and the separation is around 3000 AU. So now combining all of this spectra, we can see that the spectra of the white companions can have on average higher signal noise ratio and uh, spectral resolution. And also the similarity of the spectral energy distribution between these two classes of objects uh, give us confidence that we can use the spectra of white companions to study the similar processes that are operated by the image exoplanets. And another very good news is that there have been many white companions found so far, and they are shown in blue. So here we can see these objects span a wide range in spectral type and absolute magnitude. So their uh, atmospheres have a variety of conditions for us to explore. And in addition, I would also like to say that uh, the spectra of ultra good worlds that are free floating in the space are also templates for the image planets. Um, so, so far there has been nearly thousand uh, high quality spectra for these free floating field worlds. Although most of these objects have on average higher surface gravity uh, than the image planets. So now comes the second challenge of the models. As I mentioned earlier, we, we would like to test the model predictions uh, before applying them to a lot of data. And in, for this purpose, uh, the white companions are really appealing since they are, are valuable benchmarks to test the model predictions. Uh, so this is true given that first, uh, they can obtain high quality spectra, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, and also, most importantly, they can obtain age and metallicity independently inferred from the host stars. So for the brown dwarfs, age is really important because uh, like the brown dwarfs do not burn hydrogen in their cores. So as they age, their uh, temperature will cool down and their luminosity will become dimmer. And finally, uh, their mass, age, and luminosity are highly degenerate. So we need to know two parameters in order to derive the third one and all of the others. Um, so for the field brown dwarfs, it's not hard to uh, measure the luminosity, but it's really challenging and sometimes even impossible to determine the mass and age. So in this sense, it's really hard to robustly characterize the properties for the field brown dwarfs. But now for these wide companions, they can obtain independent age from the host stars, so their properties could be very, very well uh, characterized, and therefore these properties could be used as a standard to test the model predictions based on the uh, observed spectrum. So now given all of these aspects, in my dissertation, I have focused on studying the wide orbit companions. So my work is composed of two parts. So the first part, I have conducted a large scale search of wide orbit benchmark companions. And then I have characterized their spectra of these companions and also some free floating objects in order to test the model predictions uh, of the ultra cool atmospheres. So let's now uh, first talk about the companion survey. So before I go into the detail on my own work, I would like to uh, mention the current census of wide orbit substellar companions with mass below 70 Drupal mass. So here in this diagram, I show the projected separation of these wide companions. And throughout my work, I will make mainly focus on the companions with very wide separation, like above 500 EU. And in this particular wide separation regime, there has been nearly 40 companions found so far, and they are uh, shown in yellow. So these companions have been found by many different studies, and I have listed all of the references at the bottom. So most of these companions are actually serendipitous discoveries from the service, which are actually targeting other objects. And there are only a few large scale search for these companions, but for most of this search, their primary stars are not volume limited, basically because many surveys are conducted before Gaia. And also uh, many of this search have relied on two mass data uh, to find the co-moving companions. 
And in the end, each kind of survey listed here usually returns less than five companion discoveries. So all of these are telling us that um, the current census of white companion is not complete. And there might be still a lot of companions sitting there in the space, and we just need to find, use like deeper data to find them. So now the good news is that we do have uh, this kind of deep wide field sky surveys, which are already available or will be available soon. For example, there is a three pi survey conducted by PanSTARS telescope on Haleakala. And this survey is operated in optical wavelengths and cover three quarters of the sky with a declination above negative 30 degree. Also, there is a UK's hemisphere survey conducted by a UKIRT on Mauna Kea Observatory. Uh, and the UHS even is in the near infrared uh, covering Northern Hemisphere. And the VISTA Hemisphere Survey, or VHS, is a counterpart of the UHS in the Southern Hemisphere. CatWise is all sky, meaning for sky surveys. And looking forward, there will be a multi epoch deep optical data from the Vera Rubin observatories. So now all of this deep data uh, are tell telling us that we can find more wide orbit companions and much expand the current census. And this is the motivation of my survey, uh, which is called Cool Companions on Ultra Wide Orbits, or Coconuts. So the goal of the coconuts is to find a large sample of the wide orbit companions within 100% of the solar nearby. So first, I would like to talk about the primary stars. So in order to uh, make a list of the primary stars, uh, I have created Gaia DR2 and Hipparchus, uh, leading to 300,000 stars within 100 parsec. And here in the diagram, I show the sky map of these stars. So the uh, gray dots represent the stars with a field age, and the green circles represent the stars which are young, so they could be in the field or members of young moving groups. And then for each kind of primary star uh, around them, I have found uh, further conduct, uh, selected candidate companions by using photometry and astrometry from pan stars and always. For example, for each primary star in the list, uh, as I show here in blue, I will then search for all of the nearby sources and try to find the objects with very red color indicated of their cool temperature. And also the objects uh, who are cold moving with a star if they have a proper motion. And in this case, the process results in this kind of co-moving uh, pair. And we can see the companion has a very rare color. So repeating these kind of processes for all of our primary stars, I have therefore derived a list of candidates. So then I have conducted further follow-up observations for these candidates in order to confirm they are really giant planets and brown dwarfs and they're co-moving with a star. So as a first step, for all of the candidates, uh, which have very low signal ratio promotion, or which do not have any promotion, I have, all, I have then uh, fed them into my UCURD uh, uh, program. So from the UCURD, I have obtained additional epoch for the astrometry, and then I have combined this UCURD epoch with a previously existing PANSTARS epoch to uh, uh, compute a precise promotions. And this promotion will allow us to assess the companionship of all of our candidates. And then for all of our candidates, which are indeed co-moving with a star, either based on pan stars, power motion, or UKIRT, I have then uh, obtained further follow-up by using CFRT WorkCam, IRTL specs, and Jagna Genius. So these observations allow us to get narrow band photometry and near fair spectroscopy. And this data uh, will tell us the spectral type of these candidates. So here I show a gallery of the observed spectra for some of our confirmed ca uh, companions. So in gray, I show the observed data uh, by IRTS specs, and green, I show the observed data by Gemini Genius. So among many things, there are like many interesting individual companion discoveries. For example, like some companions, they likely have variable photosphere, and some companions are likely themselves tied binaries. And also some companions have very red, unusually red colors in their spectra, and that indicates they might still uh, retain some uh, cognitive clouds in their uh, atmospheres. So for today's talk, I would like to highlight uh, this T4 brown dwarf, uh, because this is the first published discovery from our coconuts. So here we call it as coconuts one. And in the diagram, I show the configuration. So the A component or the primary star is a white dwarf. And based on the spectral energy distribution, uh, we have derived the very uh, age of this white dwarf, which is very old, around seven giga years. And also for the B component, it's a T4 brown dwarf. And this A and B components are separated by 40 arc seconds or 1200. So in order to further investigate the properties of this companion, I have, I have then obtained IRTS spectra um, 
uh, and then I have uh, compared the observed spectra of this object with the SNOR Bobcat models, which assume the ultra good worlds are cloudless. So as I mentioned earlier, the white companions are benchmarks because they can obtain independent age from the whole stars. So for this system, I also combine the observed spectra with a white dwarf age to test the predictions from the cloudless model atmospheres. And as a brief conclusion, uh, we notice for this kind of T4 brown dwarf, it still likely have some uh, constant clouds in the atmospheres. And also it has this equilibrium chemistry, which is not surprising uh, for the brown dwarf. So in addition to the coconuts one, more recently, uh, we have uh, submitted another paper for a second discovery uh, from this survey or coconuts two. So this system is super interesting because it holds a wide orbit exoplanet. So our analysis is still on the review. So I hope you will not tweet about it at this stage. Um, so here in the final chart, I show the configuration of coconuts two, uh, and this is composed of a like bright star and the coconuts two A. So coconuts two A is a young M dwarf uh, with an age of 150 to uh, 800 million years, and we derive this age uh, based on many different indicators, including uh, lithium, H alpha, UV, X ray, HR diagram, kinematics, rotation. So what? So all of kind of uh, techniques we can use. Uh, and for the companion or exoplanet coconuts two B. Uh, it has a, a T9 spectra type. And based on the evolution model, we derive its effective temperature is very cold, it's 430 Kelvin. Uh, and these two components are actually separated by 6,000 AU, so it's pretty widely separated. And also to place this system in the context, the Coconuts 2b exoplanet is the second coldest and the second widest image planets we have found so far. In addition, this system is also located at only 10.9 parsec. So this exoplanet is the nearest image planets from the Earth that we have discovered so far. So on the right, I show the bolometric luminosity and the age of the coconuts to be as compared to many other altitude worlds with L and T spectra types. And then I have also overlaid two sets of evolutionary models. So first one in purple, I show the hot star evolutionary models, which assume the objects form with a very high initial entropy as you already used to study uh, like star-like objects or, or like high mass brown dwarfs. And in the uh, dark green, I show the co star aperture models. And these assume the objects form with a very low initial entropy uh, with a core creation like formation scenario. So we can see that most of the output dwarfs are, have their like elbow luminosity and age only consistent with the hot star models. And also if we compare the predictions between hot star and co star models, we can see they have very different predictions on the, L, the luminosity uh, at the young age is particularly younger than one years. And now in this kind of young age range, coconuts 2 b has joined fit one area B and become the second image planets whose properties are, are consistent with both whole star, uh, whole star and co star models. So in addition to this coconuts one and two systems, in total, the coconuts has already found uh, 52 wide orbit algebraic companions. So I'm now preparing the analysis for all of these objects in the hope to produce a catalog for all of these benchmarks. So here I show the projected separation of the coconut dis discoveries and compare them with the previous known census, as I mentioned earlier. So here the uh, blue histogram represents the previous, uh, the newly uh, found companions by coconuts. Uh, and in comparison, we can see uh, coconuts has more than doubled the current census of wide orbit uh, uh, companions. Uh, and also uh, our discoveries has been uh, more than like around an order of magnitude uh, higher than any previous single survey of these white companions. And in purple, I also show possible companions from our survey. And by possible companions, I mean, uh, we already confirmed they are brown dwarfs based on the spectra, but we still are collecting astrometric follow-up to confirm they are co-moving with the whole stars. So now before I end this first part about the companion survey, I would like to briefly talk about some future work that I plan to do. So at first, I would like to combine all of the coconuts discoveries to study their intrinsic distribution as a function of mass, separation, and also orbital separations. So these distributions are very important for us to know uh, how do these white companions form. So do they form like a components in the stellar binaries, or do they form like uh, uh, exoplanets in the circumstellar disk? And then, so here in the diagram, I show the figure presented by Eric Nielsen, and they have combined many uh, surveys of exoplanets uh, from radio velocity and direct imaging, and they are also more since that study. So we can see uh, like from 
like all of these surveys span a range of 0.1 to several hundred AU, and the coconuts will add a meaningful uh, data point for the very wide orbits, like above several hundred AU. And finally, combining all of these surveys will uh, develop a more comprehensive understanding about the architecture of the exoplanetary systems. And at the next uh, second step, I would also like to extend the survey by finding more wide orbit benchmark companions. So here in the diagram, I show the typical mass and the effective temperature that we can get from the coconuts by using data from panstars and always. So here in the blue region, we can see that the coconuts is pretty uh, like sensitive to a mass range of uh, like above 10 to uh, 70 Jupiter mass, basically the brown dwarf mass uh, range. Uh, however, it only has a limited sensitivity for the lower mass planets. So for the next step, I would like to uh, use uh, deeper data from UHS, VHS, CatWise, and also in the future, LSST data in order to expand this survey to find more lower mass and cooler uh, temperature uh, planets. And this kind of new sensitivity uh, region is shown in red. And this kind of upgraded search of super coconuts will therefore uh, allow us to find more exoplanets. Okay, so this is basically the first part of my dissertation. So briefly, I have conducted a, a large search of these benchmarks, uh, and I still have the ambition to find more uh, in the near future. Uh, and before I go to the next step, I would, like, I would like to just pause here and ask if you have any question for the first part. I just wanna mention that the chat is not available, Kurt tells me in this particular format. So if you do have a question, you need to speak up. Okay. All right, so thanks. I will just uh, continue. Yes, uh, please hold your question um, at the end of the talk. Uh, so after we get a lot, uh, all of these kind of uh, companion discoveries, the next step is to characterize their spectra and compare with the model pred predictions. So the typical way to characterize the object, object spectra is again to, um, many cases, use the models. And usually the models, as I mentioned earlier, will incorporate all of these processes and in the end, they will produce a grid of model spectra. And then once we get the models, we can compare with the observed spectra and try to get the best match and use the match the parameters to describe our objects. So here in this diagram, uh, I use uh, the grid dots to show the observed spectra of fit one area B. And also the red line represent the best fitted model of spectra. So this kind of data model comparison technique is usually referred to as formal modeling. So throughout my dissertation, I have used this for a modern analysis to uh, study the spectra of companions and outer who dwarfs. And briefly, instead of using the traditional method, we have used a new framework, which can help us to uh, derive more realistic parameter for series. And now I will talk about it in uh, detail. So the typical way or traditional way to do the formal modern analysis is usually uh, using the chi-square fitting with some with a linear interpolation needed to get the spectra in between the waypoints. So here I show a cartoon for that. So here uh, I show a list of spectra as a function of physical properties like TEF and uh, surface gravity. And during the spectral fitting, we sometimes need to access the models in between the waypoints. And the traditional way is actually to conduct a linear interpolation. And from that, we get a single spectrum with no uh, interpolation uncertainty incorporated. And then after that, when we compare uh, or evaluate the free parameters, the traditional way is to construct a simple covariance matrix with the uh, um, flux uncertainties placed on the diagonal axis. Um, however, in this way, uh, the, the method is assuming that uh, the spectral residual among adjacent pixels are independent. However, in reality, there are some correlation for the spectral residuals. First, the broadening effect from the instrument will cause the covariant uh, signals in the like nearby uh, near web, uh, adjacent weapons. And also, as I mentioned earlier, the model predictions do not always reproduce the data because they are tied to a certain uh, assumptions. And in this way, there are some systematic data model offsets. And this systematics could also ca uh, cause the correlation in the spectral residual. So in order to overcome the limitation of the traditional method, there is a new tool called Starfish, originally uh, developed by Ian Sackler, and this tool can have some new features that can account for all of these kind of uncertainties. So first, in terms of the model interpolation, the Starfish has a tool called Star, uh, Spectral Emulator. So this emulator combines principal component analysis and Gaussian processes. So it can produce a distribution of the interpolated spectrum. 
And this distribution can propagate the interpolation, interpolation uncertainty into the final inferred parameters. And then in terms of the coherence matrix, the starfish uh, will not only include this uh, diagonal components, but also there are some off diagonal components. And these off uh, diagonal components will allow us to propagate the correlation in, uh, among adjacent pixels. So here, let's see some uh, examples uh, about uh, the, the two methods. So here I show the derived parameter posteriors for the same object by using two different methods. So here we can see that the median values between the two methods are really consistent. However, the traditional method give us two artificially small errors, while the starfish posteriors are much more realistic. So as a next step, I have then applied the starfish to the existing high quality spectra of the ultra rewards in order to study their physical properties and compare with the models. So here, all of the gray dots are the objects I showed earlier include free floating ultra good worlds and wide orbit companions. So we can see these objects span a wide range in spectral type and absolute magnitude. And this suggests the atmospheres have a variety of conditions. Well, most of them have clouds in the atmospheres, a subset of them like late dwarfs or T9 to T7 objects, their atmospheres are likely clouds. So as we know, the clouds are really challenging to model. So as a first step for our data model uh, examination, we initiate, we start, uh, with a sample of the latent ones. And these objects are shown in blue. So these objects have a mass between 10 to 70 degree mass, and there are in total 55 objects. So the goal of this analysis is actually to compare a large comparative analysis between data and models. And through this kind of comparison or spectral fitting, we wanna tell like which part of the model predictions are consistent and inconsistent with the data. And then we wanna get some evidence to improve the model assumptions. So per, to produce our analysis, we have used the observed data from RTS specs. And also we use a models, a snow bobcat, which assume the atmospheres are cloudless. So here in this diagram, I show the observed spectra for all of our 55 objects. And then by conducting the forward model analysis using starfish, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we uh, then derive the best fitted model spectra and I show them in blue. So we can see that in comparison, uh, the fitted models really can really uh, like consistent with the observed data, although there are some uh, differences in certain wavelength ranges. And further, we have derived uh, physical properties for all of these uh, lake heat dwarfs, uh, including their effective temperature, surface gravity, metallicity, radii, mass, and volumetric luminosity. And then for today's talk, I would like to mainly talk about how we use these spectral fitting results to test the model predictions. So basically the idea is to uh, take a look at the data and model difference for each object. So in this diagram, what I will show is a spectral fitting residual or data minus uh, model uh, for each object. And then I stack all of them together and try to see if there are any common uh, structures or behavior as a function of wavelengths. So here I plot the residual of the first object, the black, the residual, and the uh, blue uh, scatter is uh, the scatter from the model predictions. And then I stack the second object, and this is the entire sample. So we can see that after we stack the residual for all of our uh, lake dwarfs, we can see they exhibit very common uh, behavior as a function of wavelengths. So there are some prominent features in the J and H bands. And this means uh, the models tend to uh, over or underestimate the observed uh, fluxes of the lady dwarfs in these wavelength ranges. So knowing the reason behind that will allow us to know uh, how can we improve the model predictions or how can we improve or modify the model assumptions. So for uh, following this idea in the J-band, I have therefore studied the J-band residual strains as a function of effective temperature for all of our lady dwarf samples. So here the y-axis is basically a quantitative metric to tell us like by how much the data and models are different from each other. So here in the diagram, we can see that there's a strong correlation and towards a cooler effective temperature, the J-band residual strengths be, uh, tend to become stronger. So one possible reason is that there, the lady dwarfs might still have some clouds, cloud opacities in their atmospheres as suggested earlier. Uh, and this cloud opacity are not included in the assumption of the cloudless models. And also uh, another way, uh, there could be some thermal composition instability 
uh, in the atmosphere as a lady dwarf, which reduce the temperature gradient. And, and given that the, our uh, models assume chemical equilibrium, this effect is not a common. So we repeat the similar analysis for the H band, and we see a similar kind of correlation between the H band residual as a function of effective temperature. So a possible explanation is that the brown dwarf might have disequilibrium chemistry, which has been long noticed. Uh, and in this way, the disequilibrium will reduce the abundance of ammonia, which have a high uh, opacity in the H band. And that's why we see this kind of structure. And finally, by combining all of our analysis about the residual, here I list all of the opportunity area of the cloudy small atmospheres. So for the next step, we will like in order to uh, fully reproduce the observed data of the lady dwarfs, we really want to use some new models which uh, incorporate all of these phenomena in their assumptions. And also through this analysis, we have established the most systematic examination of the cloudy smaller atmospheres. So this part is the like the analysis uh, for our ensemble uh, or large sample of the lady dwarfs. But for now, I would also like to highlight three objects in our sample. So there are HD 36.1b, GJ 5.0d, and Rose 458c. So these three objects are special in a way that they are wide orbit companions to stars. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, these objects can be used as a benchmarks to test the model predictions. So now I just want to show more detail about like how we can use uh, these companions to test the models. So at first, I just show a quick uh, cartoon to, to demonstrate the idea of this uh, work. So at first, we have the observed data for all of these companions. And then from the formal model analysis, we have compared with the models. And through this kind of spectral fitting, we have derived a list of their physical properties, like TEF, log G, metallicity, and anything else. But in the meanwhile, since we know the age and metallicity from the host stars, and we can mass the luminosity uh, from the companion's uh, spectral photometry, we can therefore combine these properties and use the evolution models to derive the same set of physical properties. And given that the evolution model is usually more reliable than the model spectra or atmospheric models, and therefore we can, we can use the evolutionary based parameters as a ground truth. And then we can compare the parameters from the spectral fields and the ground truths and tell to tell like whether the spectral fitting give us reliable estimates. So this is what we get for the first companion, HD 36 fit one b So again, in this kind of quantum plots, I show the delta parameter values between the spectral fields and the ground truths. And if the delta is consistent with zero, that means the spectral, that means the spectral fields is consistent with the after models and Otherwise, that means the spiral phase will over or underestimate the parameters. So for this kind of particular companion, we see the delta TAF is near zero. That means the spiral phase is pretty uh, robust for the TAF estimate, but the surface gravity and metallicity are both uh, significantly underestimated by 1.3 and 0.4 dex respectively. And the case is sort of similar when we go to the second companion with a, li uh, with a little bit lower TAF and log G. GJF SMOD. And for this companion, we see the effective temperature from the spectral fitting is, a, is a slightly overestimated by 42 Kelvin. And also the surface gravity and metallicity are both underestimated. However, the case is very different when we go to a third companion, Ross 450C. So this companion has the coolest TAF and log G among the three objects. And in, for this companion, we see the effective temperature from the spectral fitting is overestimated by 120 Kelvin. However, the surface gravity and metallicity from the spectra are pretty consistent with the evolution model. And finally, if we combine this kind of uh, parameter difference uh, of all of these three companions, we can probably draw a line connecting them. So the line starts from the first companion, which has the highest TAF and log G, to a third companion, which has the coolest TAF and log G, and lowest log G. And this probably indicates that there is a trend in the parameter difference between spectral fading and ground truths. However, we can definitely not draw this kind of conclusion by only using three companions. So for the next step, I would like to include more companions in this kind of analysis and try to study this trend in greater detail. And if this trend could be uh, confirmed, then we probably can use this kind of relation to calibrate the spectral fading results. So now before I end uh, the talk for this second part, I would like to talk about the future work. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, for the current work, uh, we have uh, initiated 
the analysis of the existing spectroscopy by analyzing a large sample of the late universe. But given that there are a lot of high quality spectra for the ultra universe, as a next step, I would like to extend our analysis to earlier and later spectra types. And by doing so, we'll be not only like test the cloudless models, but more importantly, we'll uh, test some more complex cloudy and disequilibrium models. And these models are very important for us to explain the properties of a majority of direct image planets and brown dwarfs. And secondly, I would like to um, combine the formal modeling analysis with a retrieval analysis. So retrieval is kind of different from formal modeling given that it's like a inverse modeling or inverse modeling approach. So basically the retrieval is a data-driven way uh, lights, uh, which focus on fitting the data well. And basically, sorry, there's some, some thunder outside. Um, so basically the retrieval will uh, parameterize the whole atmosphere thermal structure, uh, which is not limited by any physical assumptions. And we'll just try to seek a way like which part of, uh, which kind of atmospheres will fit the data well. Uh, so finally, the retrieval solution is sometimes physical and sometimes could be unphysical. Uh, so the retrieval results can be used to test assumptions of the green models. But in the meanwhile, the green models are still important because they are self-consistent physically. And also they can develop our understanding about uh, the brown dwarf atmospheres and help us to plan the observations. And as a last step, I would also like to extend the analysis to wider wavelength coverage. So here in the diagram, I show the difference between observations. Uh, I show the difference between observations and models as a spectral residual of the late dwarfs, as I, I mentioned earlier. So this, so our current work focuses on the near infrared wavelengths, 1 to 2.5. Well, for the next step, I would like to include the photometry from the shorter and longer wavelengths from pan stars, uh, Spitzer, and Weiss. And also, I will look forward to use a JDIC spectrum. And by com combining all of this data, we'll be able to test the model predictions covering a wide wavelength coverage and more molecular features. So now I would like to uh, sh just uh, show a brief summary of my dissertation work. Uh, so through the past six years, I have conducted a large survey of the giant planets and brown dwarfs that are wide open companions to SAR. And this survey, Coconuts, has more than doubled the current census of wide companions. Also, I have constru constructed a formal modeling framework to study the spectra of uh, late dwarfs using low resolution and near infrared data. And I have then applied this framework to study a much larger sample of the late dwarfs and establish the most systematic examination of the cloudless models. And in the future, I would like to combine all the coconuts discovery to study their formation and um, to, and also I would like to expand to, uh, to find more uh, planar mass companions. In addition, I would like to uh, extend the spectral characterization to wider ranges in spectral type and wavelengths and uh, combine them, combine the formal modeling with the retrieval. So in the end of my talk, I would like to show the acknowledgement. Uh, first, I would really like to uh, thank my advisor, Mike Liu, for all your support over the past six years. I've been like learned a lot of things by working with you. And also I would like to thank uh, my Facebook committee, including Jane, Dan, Mark, and Sven. Uh, thank you for all of your questions, suggestions, and comments. Uh, throughout the process of my dissertation, and they are really helpful. Uh, I would like to thank the Molokia and Halakla observatories for providing such a beautiful data, which are essential for my dissertation and also my exploration of the universe. And also, I would like to thank the telescope observers and support astronomers for your assistance. Uh, I would like to thank the Will, Kim, uh, Kimberly, uh, Trent, and Brandon for all of your help over the past few years in many aspects of the research. And I'm lucky to be in a very supportive Brown World community. Uh, I really enjoy talking with all of you, um, in, uh, for all of you in this field, and I look forward to our collaboration in the near future. And I, I li I'd like to thank all of my past and current collaborators for all of your comments and contribution to uh, our uh, publications. And for all of the students in my year, Christian, Misa, Travis, uh, Jia, Lucy, Ben, and Denise. And my uh, office mate, Wang Shui, uh, Erica, Mike, and of course, all of the IFA graduate students, postdoc and staff, it has been a very enjoyable journey with all of you being there. And a special thank to um, uh, Chen Cheng Ling for helping me uh, with many things like check mailbox and office while I'm re remotely working on the mainland. Also, also I wanna thank Kurt uh, for helping me to set up the UH cluster, which is a very important 
computational resource for my work. And very special thanks to Amy uh, for your kindness, patience, and encouragement for the past few years. And finally, I would like to thank my parents, Zhou Hong and Zhang Mingui, and also my partner, Dr. Yan Xiali. So my uh, dissertation will be not possible uh, without your support and love. So with all of this, I would just like to stop here and I'm ready to take your questions. Thanks. Great, thanks, DJ. Um, I, there doesn't seem to be a way in this feature to remotely clap hands, so clap hands. Uh, no one can see anybody else clapping hands, but, and only the committee members can make noise. Um, okay, good, all right. So questions, um, Kurt tells me in this format that uh, people have to raise their hands and then he will enable your microphones. So I guess we're doing this to prevent uh, unhappy, you know, past, avoid unhappy spamming incidents in the past. So if you have questions for ZJ, uh, please raise your hand. Um, Mike Nasir. Um, hi, yeah, I, I remember that Coconut One was orbiting a white dwarf, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So that means that star has already highly evolved and um, during its sort of death phases, perhaps it affected the brown dwarfs and, and orbiting exoplanets. It, tell me, have you noticed any patterns where um, exoplanets that orbit evolved stars like that have um, altered spectral, spectral signatures or are there problems posed in trying to determine their spectral type? Yeah, so, so there are some like close companions uh, surrounding white dwarfs. Uh, but for this kind of coconut one system, this is really widely separated, like 1200 AU. So in that way, we just assume they just evolved uh, like at the same time, but um, the, the effect or impact of the white dwarf primary star will not significantly impact the uh, companion. So here we are really pretty confident about our spectral analysis of the companion itself. Great, thank you. Uh, Sam Grunblatt. Okay, I think I think you can hear me. All right, uh, thanks for uh, thanks ZJ for this great talk. Um, I just had a question about uh, coconuts two or coconuts two B actually. Um, do you have any plans to determine like an astrometric or dynamical mass uh, for this system? Is that possible? Oh yeah. So so for this particular system, since they're so widely separate uh, from the, the planet is so widely separate from the whole star, we have estimated uh, orbital orbital period of one million years. Uh, and in that way, it's sort of hard to, to derive the dynamical mass because we will only get a tiny part of the orbits of this exoplanet. Uh, so in that way, it's kind of hard to get a dynamical mass. Uh, so we can only get age uh, from the whole star in this case. Got it, thanks. Uh, Bo? Yeah, CJ, uh, these objects that you have found, they are in unusual locations for uh, very young low mass objects. Uh, have you given some thoughts to why they are where they are? And also you mentioned at some point that some of the objects you found are binaries. That would also be rather unusual. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, so for the first question of this object, uh, we have uh, checked the kinematics of the like both objects and turn out to be they're just in the field. They're not associated with any young moving groups or associations. So they're just some young stars in the field. But in the in the like neighborhood of this kind of uh, primary star, we also find some other like pretty active uh, other stars. So so suggesting there's so, so some some kind of young neighbors are there. Um, and then for the uh, binaries that I mentioned, it's basically, so, so at this stage, we're still not totally sure whether the companion itself is type binary, but we see some evidence from the spectrum. So basically um, like their spectra show some peculiarities, which is not you already see from the single object. Um, so, so in that case, it is much better. So the spectrum of that companion could be much better fitted if we use a composite uh, spectra of two templates instead of using only one. Uh, but in that particular case, it could be, uh, it is uh, just a binary or it could be just uh, the object have variable photosphere. So we're trying to get more like high uh, resolution imaging follow-up for this uh, like ca candidate uh, binaries uh, to know what they're, uh, what's happening now for, for, for these objects. Okay, uh, Rolf.
Uh, Rolf, you're muted still. Uh, it looks like talking is permitted. Yep. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Hi, CJ. You compare your spectroscopic results with what you call evolutionary results. And you made the remark that the evolutionary models and the information that you get from evolutionary models is more reliable. I don't really understand why. Why, why, I mean, there are also intrinsic uncertainties in these evolutionary models concerning cooling rates, etc. So I wonder why, why you made this statement. Oh yeah, so, so, uh, so here, uh, so that, that's exactly the reason why the ground truth here is folded. So basically uh, all, of, all of the models are tied to certain assumptions. So, uh, so, so it's like, until we fully understand the universe, we can definitely not produce uh, the models that are exactly the same as the data. So in, in that way here, I would like to say the evolution models are more reliable than the model spectra. So in a way that the evolution models are basically boundary conditions for which we know um, like more uh, reliable, like for example, based on the transiting brown dwarfs uh, surrounding some stars, uh, we can see that the re uh, radii mass relation of the astronaut evolution models are really consistent with the directly measured radii. Um, but uh, for the model spectra or atm atmospheric models, there are some more components in it instead of just uh, boundary condition. So one well-known e potential issue is the uh, opacity line list. So the opacity line is, is, is definitely growing to be more, more and more complete, but there are still some kind of uh, uh, things that we could improve and that can cause the model spectra to be inconsistent with the data and further cause us to derive uh, some overall underestimated parameters. So in this case, we just assume uh, the average models are more reliable than the model spectra to make this kind of comparison. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? This is the uh, happy part where people ask very easy questions and then we'll move on to the harder part. So if anybody else has a question they, or a hard question they'd like to ask DJ, please go ahead. Oh, we have a question. We have Xu Yang uh, Yang, I don't know you, but uh, please uh, feel free to ask your question. Hi, uh, okay, you can hear me. Uh, nice job, DJ. I just have a very, very naive, naive question about the about one figure. So you have compared the residual with the effective temperature, and you are stating that the missing cloud, no, the previous one. Okay. You are stating that missing cloud opacity could be the cause. And I was one, just wondering why would the cloud have correlation with the effective temp temperature? Yeah, so it's like toward the cooler effective temperature, uh, the condensate clouds or our opacity will become stronger because at the cool temperature, it's more like it's more it's easier to form certain type of condensates. They just uh, merge together, uh, and in this case, uh, we can see in the J band the data is fainter than the model predictions. So that means the models predict too much fluxes in this kind of weapons, uh, and this is because our models do not have any clouds. And if we include some clouds, these clouds can reduce the amount of the fluxes emitted from the um, photosphere, and that will reduce or suppress the model predicted fluxes, and call and, and that will make the residual uh, become consistent with zero. Uh, so given that, we just uh, so that's why we attribute this kind of J-band residual strengths uh, to this kind of cloud opacity um, uh, potential issue. Okay, um, last chance for questions from the general audience. Okay, if not, we'll wrap up this part. Uh, let's thank CJ again for a great talk. And we will, and then uh, uh, everybody else except the committee, uh, it's your time to jump off now. CJ will be back next month apparently. And if that works out, we'll have an in-person gathering. Uh, to self, well, to celebrate or to mourn the outcome of the remaining of the defense. That was a great talk. Thank you. Thanks.